Depok 164. Today there are a lot of important developments in the northeast, namely in the Belgorod region. The commander of the Russian Volunteer Corps stated that the second phase of its operation had begun. As you remember yesterday, the insurgent forces destroyed border guards and security service forces and withdrew before Russian tanks and other reinforcements arrived at Shebekina. The goal of today's raid was to draw these mechanized forces in one direction and destroy them as well. Russian sources reported that today the insurgents attacked the Voljanka from a new and unexpected direction, namely west of the Siversky Donetsk River. To draw heavy Russian units, the insurgents used two tanks. Geolocated footage confirms that the insurgents entered the town and engaged Russian forces on the territory of the settlement. Other footage shows heavy fighting between infantry units in the residential area. As expected, the advancement was very difficult, because today Russians had more forces in the region. Some Russian sources reported that Russian forces conducted an intense artillery strike, destroyed one out of two tanks, after which the crew of the second tank abandoned an intact machinery mid-fight for fear of being the next target, which prompted all other forces to run away as well. Less prominent sources claim that the tank was not destroyed, but just damaged, and the insurgents even managed to return it to the base, while the second tank and the infantry continued their operations. Local residents reported that Russian forces had lost at least three tanks already in the first 90 minutes of fighting. Local residents also reported that the insurgents are conducting much more intense shelling, especially in the areas of regional administration and law enforcement departments, which are effectively used right now as bases. However, this is just the beginning. It was reported that the radio in certain areas was hacked, and the citizens were informed that this Sunday there would be a referendum and asked to vote for the establishment of the Belgrade People's Republic. Simultaneously, the insurgents imitated preparation for a large-scale attack near Gryveron, which they assaulted last time, and also Razova, which would be a new direction. This prompted Russians to relocate a lot of forces to these directions, which is exactly what the insurgents wanted them to do. Dozens drone operators identified and tracked the position of multiple Russian columns. Based only on the available footage, the insurgents struck at least three areas of forces concentrations that together had at least eight pieces of equipment, including four trucks. Due to the active fighting on the approach to Shebekina, thousands of civilians were evacuated. Later, the town was closed and the emergency services stopped helping the locals because they were either dead or busy fighting. Hearing about the possible referendum was the last straw, and the town was consumed by chaos. Some people started fleeing, while others took advantage of the fact that the law enforcement was too busy and started raiding supermarkets and even the houses of people who just left. While the Russian population went mad because of a lack of protection, the infighting in the Russian army just started a new chapter. This time, Chechen commanders and officials launched a concerted attack on Wagner Group financier Yevgeny Prigozhin. This attack was seemingly a response to Prigozhin's relatively neutral statement in an interview, where he was asked about Chechen forces, and he just said that he's unaware of Chechen units' new positions, and the Chechen forces usually fight for select settlements across multiple directions, and do not have one big distinct area under their control. Chechen member of the Russian State Duma, Adam Delikhmanov, called Prigozhin a blogger who is constantly crying about problems, and said that Prigozhin doesn't know about Ahmad because he shouldn't know, but if he really wants to know, they could select a time and place and teach him. Ahmad's special forces commander Apti Alaudinov made a statement as well and said that he has no respect for the Wagner head and that Prigozhin would have been killed for his critiques during the Second World War. This is ironic because the first person who started openly and viciously critiquing the Russian Ministry of Defense was the head of the Chechen Republic, Ramzan Kadyrov. He was the first who called out Colonel General Alexander Lapin for completely failing at his job and running away from the front lines, and called for demoting him to private for the massive defeat in the aftermath of the second Kharkiv counteroffensive. Then Prigozhin started doing the same, which actually united the Wagner and Ahmad forces. Both formations provide an alternative to traditional forces, which is why they try to gain Putin's favor and therefore gain more power. However, due to the violent protests inside the Chechen Republic and the growing instability, Kadyrov switched sides, likely to receive help from the Ministry of Defense to prevent a coup. That is why the Chechens attacked Prigozhin, likely by the order of the Ministry of Defense. And this makes sense because it happened the next day, after Prigozhin viciously critiqued Shoigu, Gerasimov and other elites 
for allowing Ukrainians to conduct a massive drone attack on Moscow. So Prigozhin's critique of the Russian Ministry of Defense at the most vulnerable time was the pivotal point and the main catalyst of the growing feud between previously friendly formations. And in order to verify the veracity of such historical events, the first thing I do is to make sure that it was covered by at least a dozen of reputable sources. The second thing I do is to evaluate the bias of this story, because right-leaning outlets tend to provide better coverage of bad news for Ukraine, while left-leaning outlets tend to do the opposite. In the case of the news about Prigozhin's attack on the Russian elite, we can see that it is a little bit biased to the left, meaning a more careful look is needed. But the most important indicator that I check is the share of independent news. As you can see, a lot of news sources are owned by wealthy individuals, media conglomerates and governments. A lack of independent news is a very strong signal that someone is trying to push a particular narrative, very often beneficial for these big owners and detrimental for you. In this case, we can see that 10% of articles are from independent sources, which I can easily find in the list of articles on the left-hand side. In order to easily make all these checks, I always read news on the Ground News website. Ground News compiles over 60,000 sources in one place, showing you who owns the sources, how many of them are respectable, and even their political bias. If you read only your favorite sources or let the algorithms decide what news pops up on your feed, then you definitely miss events that one site refuses to cover. Go to ground.news slash RFU to stay fully informed and avoid media bias. You can use it for free or subscribe before June 7th and get 30% off unlimited access to their Vantage subscription for just $5 a month.